Welcome to the Hacker Mindset. This is one of the first talks in the series that we're going to be, uh, be doing with Bolt uh, in cooperation with Nimit Koda. And uh, I'm, I need to apologize, the slide is not that great, but we're going to do a series of workshops, uh, really go through some real world problems and how to, uh, how to tackle those. And coming up next, 14th of September, there is an in-person workshop, workshop about, about Python um, MVP. So uh, uh, development with MVP mindset, um, then testing mindset, product analytics, and finally, how to design world-class products. But without further ado, let's... Introduce. Get started. Okay. Yeah, let's get started. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, T. And uh, thank you, Bolt and Mimit Koda for inviting me here. I'm actually not working at Bolt, unlike Tommy and, and others here. So I work at a company called WitSecure. Uh, former F-Secure as a security consultant. Uh, that means I help companies and in some cases individuals to succeed in security. Sometimes that means breaking into things, hacking things, finding vulnerabilities before criminals can exploit them and then patching those as we go. Um, other than that, I write columns to TV, which is one of the biggest uh, IT magazines in Finland. Uh, I do podcasting. Uh, well, my my weekly podcast actually just this week we we ended that after two years but but other than that i've been doing podcasts for for some time like spreading information security knowledge spreading knowledge about how hackers and criminals and and people like that operate and then as well uh, maybe could be of interest to some of you but i'm a board member of women for cyber finland so uh for women for uh, women of uh women in cyber women for cyber sorry uh, we also have some events coming up and and we we build communities around uh women working in tech and actually working in info information security uh, if you want to follow me uh, there's my instagram and my twitter handle uh, down below here uh Actually, T is standing a little bit in front of me. Thank you. But yeah, uh, then T, do you want to talk a little bit about yourself? My favorite topic. <laughs> um, so hi, I'm T. Um, I've been doing this stuff for more than 30 years. Majority of my career, I've been doing offensive information security, meaning breaking into things, hacking things apart, but also uh, a lot of incident response, more than 500 engagements throughout my career. Um, Move for the majority of you, if if any of for any of you, uh, I'm doing this podcast called Gentlemen Hackers, Herrasmia Sakkarit in Finnish, together with Mikko Hyppönen. Um, and in addition to that, I also founded a conference called T2. Uh, it stands for Technin and Tietoturva. But as it was unpronounceable, all the foreigners we just decided to make it shorter. Uh, we've been doing that for close to 20 years. Actually, next year will be the 20th year anniversary on that. So if you're into hardcore information security or hacking, that's the place to go. 99 attendees, but I ain't one. All right, mindset, you say. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about hacker mindset. So this means that we will discuss about all the techniques and, and ways of, of thinking when, when hackers, and we're going to soon distinguish between hackers and criminals, but let's just talk about hackers. So how hackers operate, how do they have to look at things, and, and how do we uh, make uh, or how to break into systems. Um, in addition to that, we will talk about things that we all can apply to our lives and, and company-wide and also on personal level, how to then, when we know how these attacks take place, how we can mitigate those and how we can protect against those types of attacks. But I know for some of you, maybe, maybe not, but uh, the word hacker can sound a little bit intimidating. It can sound a little bit naughty even because something, it all, always has the connotation of doing something illegal almost. And I know now I'm speaking as a woman myself and, and from my background, I feel that as a girl and as a woman growing up, we were always taught to kind of like uh, behave and, and we were rewarded for behaving nicely, for uh, sitting nicely, for, for being put in uh, to sit, well, like we put sit, sitting next to the kind of like the people who were causing trouble. So we were always rewarded for, for thinking and, and acting nice. 
So that's why I think for some of you, this hacker can sound like it's something that is un unachievable or it's something that is kind of like not, not quite me. But it's, it's not the case because hacker uh, and the hacker mindset, it's also about, uh, it's, it's something that you can also learn to some extent, at least. It, it's about the techniques that criminals use. It's about the techniques and the practicality that we can make uh, computers and, and technology that we use do stuff that they were not originally intended to do. <clears throat> to do. So that's why I think it's, it's important to distinguish between, uh, uh, and one more thing, because being a hacker, it's not about breaking stuff and, and breaking things down. It's also about making or doing good stuff. It's about making things work in a better way. So instead of thinking uh, of the hacker mindset of, so, of something as purely criminal, it's actually something that, that is aimed to do or, or is aiming to do good, especially when we're talking about people like me and T. We have worked extensive careers, T a little bit older than me, so a little bit older, yeah. or like uh, more in this field, but it's still something that we do in order to make this world a better place. So I think that's something that, that we all share. And it's like, I want, want all of us to kind of like look past also the hacker, like the word and, and think about it, something that can be employed to do a lot of good things. I know that we lost the, lost the war on the definition of the word hacker, but originally it actually meant a person who is able to use something in a non-intended manner. So you would take something you might you might be modified in, in you might you might modify it in a way to achieve something that was originally maybe the thing was not designed for it. Uh, so just to give you a practical example of myself. Uh, when I was 12, uh, one of the first hacks that I did was that there was a roulette machine next to the gas station that I was living with. And, and uh, when you're like roughly 12, 13 years old, your toolbox is not exactly what is it is it's nowadays. And it was this roulette machine. We were still using Finnish marka at that time. And you actually had to put four markas in in order to tap a single square there so let's say let's say that you put your money on number six or something and then if you were to win you would get it back tenfold meaning for markas investment and you would get 40 back and i was like just thinking like okay how can i make this thing do something else like how can i basically hack this machine and the trick that i came up with was that i would just unplug the power cord and put it back in and the first number would always be number seven, consistently. Um, it took me close to 30 years to understand why. Um, I, I'll tell you later on if you're interested, but, but uh, that was the first hack that I came up with. And it has to do with how you're seeing cryptography, basically. And um, then the second hack that I came up with, I was already at that time, was playing guitar. And I had this habit of tapping the machine. And I, this one day I know, noticed, that if you tap the buttons like real fast, it actually slows down. And you know, have you ever heard of this guy called Eddie Van Halen? He's really good at playing guitar. So I started tapping those buttons like crazy. And with a little bit of practice, you could actually target the, the light that was highlighting the number. You could target that within a three squares. So you would put 12 marks in, you would always get 40 back. And the, the reason why that worked was that when you were tapping those machines or, or those buttons on that machine, it would receive so many interrupts, meaning that the processor that was handling the keyboard input, it would get so many interrupts that it would actually slow it down. It's not important. You don't have to really understand anything about computers, but to me, that's hacking. Just making something unintended to happen. And um, it, to me, a hacker can be a painter, it can be an artist, like a musician, it can be pretty much anything. It's just a way how you think and approach things. Absolutely. And I think that's why it's super important to do the distinct distinction between hackers, like having the hacker mindset, having the uh, thinking and, and the ways of finding uh, like the ways of, of something like, find, for example, how you uh, discover the uh, the roulette machine thing. So doing something 
operating something, talking with someone, doing your craft and finding easier ways of doing it, like kind of like exploiting stuff that is already in the system, in the way you work and just make it more efficient, for example. But yeah, there are people, unfortunately, in this world who would use these types of techniques and, and ways of working and this kind of mindset in order to make money, for example, or gain some sort of leverage, for example, intelligence or, or things like these. So these kind of people, they may have the hack hacker mindset and they may think in this similar manner, but they are actually criminals. And one example, like we're, we're living here 2022 and actually uh, criminal activity online is more organized than ever. We have criminal organizations such as Conti, whose internal chat messages got leaked earlier this year. And they revealed, for example, stuff that we probably already knew, but, but it came, became more public that they're using basically the same tools that we are using. They're using the same kind of methods that we are using in order to conduct criminal activities. So this is the distinguishing between us and, and you guys, and, and then people who are benefiting from this kind of mindset uh, you, through criminal activities. Should we talk about targeting? Let's go. So as a hacker, you take something, let's say a roulette machine or something. Let's say that you want to break into some place let's say a home computer or whatever, there are certain things like as, a, as an attacker or an, as, as a defender, you basically, you're looking at the same thing, but your mindset might be very, very different. So on the left-hand side, you have things that actually impact the offensive side, meaning that you're trying to take over whatever your target is. And then on the right-hand side, you have the defensive side. So this is how a defender might see these things. I'm not saying that this is a comprehensive list of things, just one way of trying to illustrate it, like what we mean by that. If we go through these one by one, the first one might not be very obvious. So if you're doing something illegal, there is no way that you can actually use or employ absolutely the same things that as you would do if you were you, if you were doing something uh, legal so maybe you cannot buy services for example maybe you you want to store something or you you want to run a web host or something you need to pay money for that and how do you pay money because if you you're using your own credit card your criminal career will be a very very short one um, so maybe you first need to steal those credit cards or something this is the like, criminal way of thinking. But even if you're not a criminal, if you were to do some like real world red teaming exercises, so red teaming is basically a term that is used for uh, people like Laura and myself, that a company would recruit us uh, to break into their systems, or basically it's also called goal-oriented pen testing, which means that they will just give us a target, a flag, that now please go and steal our source code or get the administrative access to some system or so. If you're a bad guy, you cannot use these same kind of things that, that we could be using. So the more operational security you need, the more it will impact your actions. Yeah, yeah, because we, we don't have to worry about getting caught. And sometimes actually, for example, for red teaming activities, we actually want to get caught so that the company can learn from, from our attacks and, and they can then uh, enhance their security posture. But yeah, as T said, um, we as regular users, and even if we're like doing some some hacking sort of, a sort of activity, we are probably not doing it for criminal activity, for conducting criminal activities. So, so operational security or OPSEC even, I think we may be dropping that term at some point, uh, is, is it's something that, that needs to be then considered on a whole new level. And of course, modern technology offers some kind of, uh, or better kind of like pri privacy enhancing features. And, and sometimes the criminals, they're using even the same kind of tools we're using. For example, they may be using Telegram, they may be using Discord and these kind of like familiar sounding tools, just because they are easy to use in a manner that, that they can automate stuff 
it's harder to get caught and, and things like these. So, so even though the mindset is different, the tooling and the, the things that they are using could be really familiar sounding to you all as well. The second point here is basically a thing called attack surface. So if I'm given a target, the only thing that I'm thinking is like, okay, what are the possible places that could help me to achieve what I want to achieve? I've been trying to illustrate it with this photo. Like if you have ever had Legos, you know, they have these daily meetings when they're targeting the soul of your food and, and they're target trying to target these soft areas. Now, obviously attacking your soul, soul is not very productive, but what you can do instead, like let's say that you're trying to compromise a computer, a laptop. In that case, the attack surface is everything that is in on the laptop, like all the interfaces, like all these, like there is an RJ45 connector, meaning that for a network cable, there are USB connectors, there is keyboard. Uh, if you unscrew the back panel of the computer, you can access all the all, all kind of different circuits from there. You can get access to memory and so on. This is attack surface. And, and guys like us, we're constantly thinking like, okay, if that's my target, how would the attack surface look like? Yeah, and this is just a physical attack surface, and I think this is an easy way to illustrate it, that we are using a physical machine that has these entry points, but of course everything we do on those computers, the software we're using, the things we download, the messages we open, and we as humans as well, we are also part of the attack surface. So it's both physical and also the things that we use and how we use it. Very often we seem to think that we have a work life and a personal life, but for an attacker, it doesn't really matter. For an attacker, it's actually one huge single attack surface. Like if we are looking at things like 2016, the, the head of the Democratic Party uh, got, called, got owned by the, the Russian intelligence, that started from his own personal Gmail account. And that had nothing to do with with the Democratic Party. It was just Joe Podesta's own personal email account. So you're also like you're if somebody's targeting you, your work life and personal life are interchangeably a one huge single attack service. Oh. I'm throwing stuff around just as I promised that I wouldn't throw this around. I'm throwing it around. <laughs> Yeah, and this is a really important point to make from criminal perspective, especially it's unfortunately we as humans are sometimes the easiest thing to trick and, and easiest part of getting into places. And another example would be for LinkedIn, which which is now like or recently has been uh, extensively used by criminals to spread um, malicious links or, or malware. And that's a good example of, of us both kind of like having this personal aspect online, which is directly accessible to the criminals, while we're also part of communities. It can be work, but it can also be communities. It can be that we are part of something bigger that is important. And unfortunately, we may not always be the most important thing or the most interesting thing, but we just happen to be one step uh, one of the steps to get into the places that the uh, criminals and the attackers want to get into. And this bridges nicely to the next topic, which is an attack path or attack tree. So like Laura mentioned, uh, very often the attackers are thinking in graphs. So you're using, maybe you're just one step on, or a stepping stone on, on, the, the, like on, on a way to the final goal. So maybe you can Laura walk, walk this this one through yeah absolutely so uh we may hold something that is of value and something if we think on personal level something that we would not want to leak is for example photos on our device so there's not just one way of of getting into that and sometimes it's not even viable of directly attacking something so let's take the example of having photos stored on our phone uh, hacking phones is difficult or if we want to spend some million dollars, we could buy potentially like malware that we can then use to exploit these phones, but potentially we don't have that money. So if we are just a, a criminal 
a hacker or someone with uh, criminal intentions or evil intentions even, uh, we would find ways into to the target, but there could be multiple ways of, of getting to the target. And while the attackers, they may not draw these kinds of graphs open, like, yeah, first I'm attacking this part and then this one and this one, but they are thinking in a way of, of first gaining access to something, then what happens? Then something else happens, then we gain access to something else and move. Uh, sometimes we use term move laterally, for example, or pivot to other services or devices. But basically what that means is that, that the hack is very rarely just one thing, one exploit. It is multiple things combined that then lead to certain objective. This is not an elegant sport. Like the, you're not being scored by the elegance of the thing. Like it's, it might be that your one of the steps might be, for example, in this <clears throat> list that <clears throat> sure. So you might be able to get access to somebody's email just like for a short period of time. What you could then do, you could use that email address to reset some other account and get access to that, and then pivot from there to your final destination. Or it could be that somebody's so just shoulder surfing your you when you're when you're opening your phone and they see your passcode or something. So you might be able to combine as an attacker, and it's very typical that you actually combine all sorts of different things. Some of them might in, involve processes, some of them might involve humans, some of them might be technological stuff and so on. But the, the end goal is that you're actually getting access. In this case, you're getting access to the photos. Yeah. And one more thing is that there, like, maybe I already said this, but there's always many ways of getting to something. So there's not just one way. And that's why it makes also defending difficult, which we will get to in a second. But but it's not just one thing that we can then patch up, put a firewall there, put a antivirus software there, and then we're golden, we're fine. But it's multiple things. And then uh, for criminals, that's that's always a gift because they can spend just more time and then find new, new ways of, of getting into places. We're later on going to be talking about layered security models. Uh, there is this old saying that good security is like an onion. It has multiple layers. And if you want to try and cut through it, it makes you cry. Uh, that's literally what you want to aim for in your defense. The problem, however, is very often defenders think in lists, not as graphs. Um, this is the primary reason for a transparent security feature. And now I hear you asking, like, what is the transparent security feature? It's basically a feature that exists on paper, but it's invisible to the attacker. Um, many of the compliance frameworks actually fit this category quite nicely. So the, it's the, you should always aim for things that actually make sense. If you're thinking as lists, as a defender, like, okay, I need this tick box, I need this tick box, and you don't understand what is actually valuable. Well, let's say that you want to protect your photos better. You know, changing your shoes doesn't really help, right? Uh, so the actions that you're doing, they need to have a, some sort of an impact to that graph that we showed earlier. So you, as a defender, you can go through that. We call it reverse attack path map. What a surprise. So you, you just walk it backwards and you try to impact those different nodes on the graph. So you're making decisions that will effectively make the job of an attacker harder. So why security controls then fail? If we know all this, like why it doesn't work? Well, there are multiple reasons. There are basically, you can roughly put these into two categories. There is simply stuff that collectively we might know about, but you know, your best friend knows about this, but for reason or some other, you just fail to apply it. And a typical example here uh, would be a buy clock. You know, it's a great lock, but if you use it like that, it's not gonna, gonna like really move the needle, right? This is like uh, rearranging the deck chairs on Titanic. Like it's not really have a, not gonna have a true impact on anything. And, a okay, and I think for this picture, you may also have a bad day and you're just like 
getting to work and oh, I'm so tired. Let's just tie this to a bike up. But yeah, yeah whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's an old bike anyway. Yeah. Or one more thing that is a really good, like concrete example. We all know that we should be protecting, for example, our, our accounts with multi-factor authentication, with strong passwords. But the reason why we fail to apply these things, this is an example of a uh, entrepreneur in uh, using Instagram and, and her uh, her Instagram account got hacked via a phishing phishing attack. So someone sent her an email or message, and then she opened a link and basically gave her information into a site that then collected this information. Uh, but the thing is that I think the reasons why we fail to apply this sort of mitigation is quite uh, obvious, because sometimes the security mitigations, they can be really hard to use in day-to-day -day life. For example, if we are not using correct then like correct tooling to support the usage, of, for example, of strong passwords. If we are not using password managers, it can be really tricky to remember all your number, letter, special character passwords by yourself. So it's just like a hard practice to use. And this is just a very easy example, but another example from my life, for example, I used to study nursing for a year before I went to study IT. And um, I did my first uh, first internship at a hospital. And instead of uh, like protecting the computer that we use to log all patient information that was basically behind one password or sometimes just left unlocked because it's not always that the users of these devices are interested in computers themselves. It's not that they are it's just one way of doing work. So, so that's why we also fail to apply security mitigations because they can be hard to use. And that's why we can also work to make those things better. And that's one thing that we can then apply in our jobs, in our lives to support uh, security best practices. The second bucket of things is that there might be some things that we're just simply not aware of. I mean, for example, there is not a single person on this planet who knows how to build a skyscraper, yet we have many. And it's because people are cooperating and, and they're doing stuff together. But it might be that we wouldn't be able to build a skyscraper that is, for example, hurricane proof or something. So it's simply stuff that we don't know about. And an example of this would be like if you're you know, you, you have toddlers in the house and you're, you're trying to protect them with this kind of thing. And you think that you're solid and then you just fail to realize that you can just remove the top floor, top drawer and get access to that box. You know, toddlers, they are really, really creative. Or it might be that your visibility is hindered. So you might be seeing something, but your data points are just absolutely wrong. So, and th this can be, um, this can happen on multiple levels. Like, you know, yeah, I know it's it's pretty addictive. You, you can spend ages watching it, right? Um, but sometimes you just do miscalculations. And that's also because basically the root cause for things that you just don't know about. Yeah. And one example of stuff we don't know about, for example, when we are uh, developing software or using any kind of technology, there could be vulnerabilities that we just simply don't know about. We, we may be uh, voluntarily introducing something into our lives that could be vulnerable. And that is, of course, none of our fault, but that's why we need to um, then employ different types of methods, whether we're working at a company. Now, this depends on, on what kind of background you're from. You can then leverage information or leverage other people into trying to make your code secure, for example. Or then we are just, uh, uh, if, if we are just using technology or devices, we can make sure to update them regularly and try to keep ourselves updated and secure. But there are a lot of stuff that we just simply don't know about, and and it's it's not really our fault always, even. Fortunately, majority majority of these things actually fall in the first category. So we just fail to apply it. Now, the problem is that the world is full of information. How do you know what you really need to do? And uh, now we try to answer that one. Mm -hmm. So on the defensive side, we have a few things here that apply both on your personal life and also in a wider, like maybe a, a corporate setting or something like that. The first one is threat modeling. And threat modeling is a fancy way of basically defining like how you should protect yourself. Like let's say that you're going abroad 
And you want to make sure that nobody's going to pickpocket you. You're making a threat model to, to basically try to make it easier to understand. You're asking yourself three questions. Like, what I'm protecting against what? Like, what is the thing? Like, in this case, it would be my wallet. I'm protecting it against a pickpocket. And then for how long? Well, as long as I'm abroad, and well, hopefully even longer, uh, because it's not like you you lose interest to your wallet after you come back. Um, and that's basically <laughs> the way to think about these things. And and it, it's it, it ain't rocket surgery, right? Uh, so it, it's it's pretty common sense to do these these kind of things. And if you're into software development world. Um, there are also frameworks that are, the, this sounds way more fancier than they are actually are. For example, there is a Microsoft developed uh, thing called Stride, it stands for, for these things. And there the idea is that you take uh, a system and you apply all these six questions. Like I have my Vault application, it's communicating with the backend service of Vault. Okay, can I spoof my identity? Can I impersonate to be somebody else? Can I tamper the contents of the communication? Can I do a denial of service attack and so on? So basically you ask these six questions for each and every API or interface that you're dealing with. But the general principle, you can apply this to anything. I'm not expecting you to do this when you're going abroad. You're like, oh, can I spoof myself? when I'm taking my wallet out of my back pocket, like it, it doesn't work like that, but you, you get the basic idea. Yeah, can you go back a couple of slides to the, uh, yeah, one more. Yeah, one more. Yeah, it's just slow. Yeah, uh, no, the previous <laughs> one, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and the good thing about this is, as, as T also mentioned, that you can apply this to everything. Like you don't have to use Stride for your life, but uh, in terms of, of understanding what is re relevant, we can use this sort of thinking for, for anything, whether it's software, whether it's our life and, and our individual threat models, for example, for our life, uh, for our personal life could be very different from, from one another. For example, some of us may have a uh, ex-spouse who is, who is stalking us or, or we have, may have problematic uh, like relationships or, or things like these. So these are immediately things that you need to take into con consideration when you, when you are using your devices, when you are posting anything online. So, so these sort of things, they, they, I think the biggest val value of these is when they are done with, uh, with great care, they can give you information about the things that you should be afraid of and the ways how to mitigate those instead of afraid of everything in life, because that's not something that is healthy or good for anything or anyone. Word. So then viewers. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I think this is something that we are already kind of started to talk about, but the uh, good enough thinking so that there is, there is no 100% secure stuff. There's always going to be vulnerabilities. There's always going to be stuff that can be exploited. But whether that is relevant or not is then another question. And if you go forward, you can go through the example. I think that's a good example. So uh, as like uh, as a security engineer, or if you're designing something, like we have this pet peeve on our industry that, you know, if we were to design the security or safety systems for a car, the first thing that comes to my mind is like, oh, okay, it needs to be meta proof. Like, you know, the, 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 in, in an unlikely event of asteroid hitting my car, it needs to survive that. Well, how realistic is that? Uh, where in, like, in reality, the airbags are actually pretty solid protections that will cover like 99% of the cases that you actually care about. And this is the good enough thinking. Like, you should never go for the improbable or, or, or so, like, use common sense and come up with solutions that are in par or are on par with the problem that you're trying to solve. Yeah, and there's also negative side effects if we want to patch everything and if we want to make this car meteor proof, because then it would probably mean that it would be really hard to drive because it's full of, I don't know, metal and like just stuff around it to protect us from the meteor. And that applies to security measures as well. If we make them too difficult to use, People will find ways of using it in an easy way. Kind of, again, the hacker mindset of, of how can I use this car?
but but without actually like uh, employing the protections or then using a cheaper car which doesn't have any of the protections at all. User experience is always more important than security. You need to find a balance between those two. Yeah, and I think those can also go hand in hand because if, if user experience is bad, then then yeah, no one's going to use your software or they're going to use it in a manner that was not intended. Which is a hacker way of doing. <laughs> Which we encourage everyone to do. <laughs> but then let's so let's say a few words about observability. Observability actually means that you have visibility over the things that are important to you. Let's say that example about photos, your photos, you want to know if somebody else is looking at those photos or, or if somebody is trying to steal them. That's visibility the, or observability. That's basically the industry term for it. And the one way how you could think of this is that, you know, every time when you go to Las Vegas and you win that quarter of a million from this one, from one armed bandit, what happens is that they're actually going to isolate the machine. They're going to take you to the next room. They're going to interrogate you and, and then see if you're actually one of the known accomplices uh, or if you're one of the bad guys that they know about. They're going to take the machine apart. They're going to run, run through diagnostics to it uh, they, because these machines, they actually operate um, they basically obey this principle of pseudo randomness. So the casino is required by the law to return 98% of the money that comes in, they need to return back. So they only keep 2%. And in order to do that, these computers or these, these unarmed bandits, they need to be predictable. And they actually know when these machines are supposed to give payouts. So when they're supposed to give money out, right? So they can run diagnostics against it and they can see whether the machine was supposed to be paying money or not. They're also going to go through all the CCTV footage and so on. So the casinos actually realize pretty early on that there are going to be attacks that they're never going to know about. But this is observability at play. They are doing everything in their power that they have enough data points to decide whether this was legit or whether it was not. Yeah, and sometimes it's it's important to know at that moment if something is is alarming behavior. But sometimes it's just good enough to have the observability to go back to the events afterwards and know and kind of like investigate if if there is actually something that we should be worried about or or not, and to what extent a crime, for example, like what happened when a uh, attacker got in or criminal got in, like what did they access? what kind of stuff did they steal and and what kind of mitigations that can be applied and for for personal life, for example uh, i know that the tools we're like the software we're using and for example social media platforms we're using um, they're not super transparent always about for example the data they're collecting but that may not be relevant in terms of security but if you're worried, for example, if your data is out there, someone is stealing it, there are ways of, of gaining visibility into that as well. You can use tools such as uh, badrap.io or haveibeenpound.com. Uh, we didn't write those down, but if you if you search uh, from Google, for example, have I been pre have I been breached or have I been hacked? I think it should pop up quite in the results of the search so you can gain visibility into the what kind of data has been stolen from me and what kind of data has been leaked from me so so that's one way of getting uh, observ observability into our personal life also every time when you're logging into your google account you're getting this email that hey i saw that you just logged in was this you same with netflix and so on that's observability in play mm. it gives that's a very powerful indicator that somebody might be like some, somebody might have stolen your credentials to your Netflix account and they're going to ruin your playlist and whatever. Uh, but that's basically observability. You want to see, you have want to have visibility over these things because it's basically an early warning system for the bad things to happen. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a very, very powerful concept. Um, there are a lot of different techniques how you can make it even more efficient. Then the last defensive thing, and we're going to spend quite a lot of time. Don't be afraid of the security engineering part, because this is basically 
it's not that much about security engineering. It's about patterns or different kind of things or rules, if you will, uh, rule of thumbs that you can use on your daily life uh, in order to defend yourself or, or, or a company even. These are defensive principles known the word. If you're able to do any of these things, you're always going to be better off. Um, so increasing the cost for an attacker, your smartphone is a brilliant example of that. So if you have uh, a, a brilliant Apple device, um, nowadays an exploits chain that allows you to take that over costs roughly five to 10 million euros. And every time you can ask yourself, like, you know, according to the law real, are you worth it? So if an attacker is willing to spend five to 10 million euros to you, then you're worth it. But the attacker, every time when they're using these tools, they are risking their own tool chain. It might get burned on a day, and then they effectively just threw 10 million euros out of the window. So that's how you're, that, that, that's how Apple has made it so expensive to compromise that it's actually a super hard target. The same thing like with decreasing the value. So maybe you can, you can make some things work in a way that even if the attacker would achieve their goal, they wouldn't really get anything valuable out of that. There are multiple examples of that, but, but um, we can come back to that later on. The, the third one is basically, this is more about corporate setting. Like uh, if, if the person is able to, or the attacker is able to get access to something, typically it means that they, some, at some given point, they will need to pivot or, or use something else as a stepping stone in order to get, get their final goal. And if you're able to stop that chain, if you're able to remove one of those stepping stones, they're not going to achieve their goal. Uh, and there are examples of that as well coming later on. Um, observability, we already talked about that. And then the last point, you want to order, the make, make it, you basically you want to maximize your chances of detecting if something is going horribly wrong. Um, we'll, we'll come back to that later on as well. So patterns. Weakest link, Laura, would you like to go first? Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, the uh, I know this is your your example, but but uh, weakest link is the it's always like if we think about engineering for from the hacker side. So now from the attacker side, it doesn't really make sense to over engineer stuff when things are easy to exploit. For example, that there are patterns like this. So. So we have protections applied. Okay, we have, for example, um, we have uh, multi-factor authentication enabled for, for all of our uh, users in our enterprise network. But okay, then we have this separate entrance right next to the other one where we have RDP or remote access, like remote desktop protocol port. So remote access open to the internet with some default credentials. So, so there's always like, like the... For example, the attacks that I've seen and the attacks that are discussed in public, now I'm talking about the criminal activities, they typically, they don't start by, by over-engineering stuff. It's always easiest to attack where the, where the defenses are soft, softest. So for example, uh, sending malware directly to employees in a company, sending malware phishing sites, uh, sending phishing sites directly to people and getting access to, to um, to account uh, through that. So um, I think there's a kind of like a misconception that these, these attackers, they're sometimes these mega masterminds and they are able to exploit everything, which is not actually true. The technology, especially modern technology is getting quite good at, at uh, blocking certain types of technical attacks, but then these process and human related attacks are typically the weakest link. And then further down, we were talking about the graph and the attack paths, then further down that 
that line, there could be something that requires more technical know know how or or things like that. But but the weakest links are always the easiest ex to, uh, easiest to exploit. And while security controls are not applied th uh, thoroughly, for example, this door is not blocking the whole uh, doorway. It means that there are always people trying to take advantage of that because it's easy. There's tooling already available. Why do something when like something else when there's alre already something that exists that we can use to exploit things like this? So there is a fundamental security principle, uh, meaning that you should never have two alternative ways to the same goal. Let's say that you have an, your account, your Google account, or even, even better, let's say PlayStation Network account. They actually force you to pick security questions. Now, if you think that as an attacker, I have two avenues in. I can either try to guess your password or, 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 or I can steal it. But then your security question, like in which city you were born, like which one you think is, is more difficult? Like, especially here in Finland, we have like five cities. So if you guess three times, you have at least like 66% chance of, of getting it right, right? Or even more. And, and uh, th th that's basically the principle that you should always have things that are equal. Like I have another example here, like uh, did they really think this true? You know, it, 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 this is a primary example of stupid stuff. Like, why would you pay 16 euros for that pillow, right? Because you can get the same pillow with 10 euros. And this is the principle at work. So you should always secure the weakest link first. Then defense in depth. This is the onion principle. Yeah, so uh, like we mentioned before, if we just uh, apply some security control to one place and think that, okay, now we're done and we're good. Uh, that's not really going to save us because again, there are multiple things that happen in order for an attack to succeed. So for example, in Ocean's 11, they don't just need to barge in and uh, figure out how to open the doors to the vault, but they also need to figure out how to avoid detection by CCTV, how to, for example, cause some kind of disruption in, in other place and things like these. So uh, in order to uh, powerfully mitigate these kinds of attack, we need to understand that the attack is never a straight line. It's always multiple things. And, and in understanding the motives of the attacker, we can understand that, okay, if there's a bank robbery that is going to happen, the bank door, the vault door is probably the last step of the attack. There's always like multiple mitigations before that, that try to either prevent, detect, or block completely uh, the attacker before they can get to their goal. And even if the bad guys are able to steal the money, there still might be a pro probability or a possibility that there would be a tracking device hidden somewhere with the bills or that the serial numbers are recorded. So when the, when the bad guys are using that money, for example, did you know that if, you're, if you have a 50, 50 euro bill and you take it to the store, they actually scan it. And if, if the serial number is used or if it's like recorded elsewhere that it's being stolen, they, they, the system is going to alert you automatically. Yeah. So you can still get burned. Even if you're able to do a perfect bank heist, you still might get burned later on. And this is defense in depth. Yeah, or your accomplice might rat you out in, in order to get more exactly. money. <laughs> Which happens in every movie, right? <laughs> um, then we have exception handling. And this is basically uh, an idea that how... <clears throat> a, any given thing, like the roulette example that I gave you earlier, that how a system or a thing works on, uh, when, you, when you expose them to corner cases. So you're doing something unexpected um, and then the results might be very, very odd. So I don't know if, how many of you are, are fluent in, um, in Cumbri, the, the Welsh language, but um, if you translate that um, it actually translates the following too. So uh, basically what happened was that this person sent an email to this translation service and got a reply back and it was not maybe what they were expecting. 
And this is very, very typical. Like uh, there are like numerous examples of that. Like previously, uh, when Kokaupa released their Plusa systemi thing, um, you could you could get, get those blah, blah, blah points. Um, but if you actually forged re the reply and made it negative, you got unlimited an unlimited number of Plusa points. And because that it, it was only because they were not they didn't know how to handle negative numbers because effectively, I mean, if you're buying something, you should never get negative numbers back, right? Uh, but that's that's just one of the examples how you can abuse these kind of things. Mm. Yeah, and it's it's about the logic of the system, so that the system logic or the technology or the software was designed to work in a certain manner, but then in a case of an exception, what happens? That's that's one of the things that on technical level, for example, uh, when we're trying to find vulnerabilities, that is a really uh, interesting thing to look for. For example, what happens if you send incorrect type of input to a uh, website or a server? What happens? Is there a response? Is there a crash? And, and can we then somehow leverage that ex exception situation? It's also important to understand the difference between safety and security. For example, if you have an electric clock and there is a power outage, if it opens, then it's safe because the people can get out from the building. If it stays closed, it's secure because people are not going to be able to go inside the building or leave the building. So there is a difference between safety and security here as well. And that has a lot to do with exception handling. Like you need to know what will happen. Like basically you want to be predictable. You want to understand like how the system works or whatever the target it is. Uh, that like, like what's gonna happen if something <coughs> unexpected happens. Least privilege. Yeah, least privilege is probably one of the in my opinion, one of the most important things in securing, especially data and 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 uh, even our lives. So least privilege means that not everyone in the same hotel has access to every room. For example, imagine you were a guest in in a hotel and you were given the key card and you were able to access all of the rooms in inside that hotel. That's exactly what happens if you are using the same password to Facebook. To, to Twitter, to, to some small uh, news outlet that you were using that got hacked. And then that same key can be used to unlock all of your social media accounts and all of your digital identity, basically. So uh, that's what it means on personal level, but uh, on, on company level. It's, it's then it's basically a question. For example, at Vault, it means that not everybody will have access to your data. Like we're limiting the amount of people and a lot of systems that they're going to be able to access any of your data. So basically, it's also sometimes referred as needs to know principle. So basically, you're making sure that you only have the privileges to do your job, but nothing else. Uh, because maybe someday you, you're going to lose your keys or whatever, something unexpected might happen. So the least privilege principle is extremely powerful. That's also by the way, if there are any Mac users here, the first account that is being created when you um, when you install or when you when you take your Mac computer into use, that's an administrator account, and you should never be using your computer as an administrative account. So the trick is that first you install it or you take it into use, then you create a regular user account and then use that on a daily basis. That's once again a least privilege thing. Also, web browser there there extremely complex things and modern web browsers they're actually limiting quite a few of the actions that you can do as a user in order to protect you in an efficient manner and that has a lot to do with least privilege yeah and on technical level if there are any any people for example doing sysadmin or developing on, on cloud infrastructure it can get really complicated how to actually employ least privilege in practice but then uh, it basically means that the programs even, not just human users, but the programmatic access and the software should only have the access that they need uh, to certain services or in the context or on the server where they are running so that they don't have access to absolutely everything. So it's very same with computers and humans. Then positive security model. 
first? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, or do you want to go first? You had a really good analog on the, or the bouncer. Yeah, so um, basically, uh, this is very often used in software engineering, but it applies to other things as well. Like if you're going to a bar, the positive security model is basically like the prison, the bouncer will have a look at your ID and check the, the age. And if that is okay, then they are gonna let you in. They're not gonna have a look that, okay, are you, are you tall enough or are you, are you using like red clothes or something like that? Unless it, it's a really, really fancy bar. <laughs> well, there, there's that, but I wouldn't know about that. Um, <laughs> But it also this positive security model is it uh, when we were talking about, let's say, software development. And, you know, every time when you're using an e-commerce site, there is a box that asks for your zip code. A positive security model there would mean that we would have a predefined list of all the zip codes, or at least we would make sure that is, it is a number that you're putting there. In Finland, it's usually five numbers, at least so far that I've seen. And it's a predefined list of five numbers. We know all the possible combinations because POST is kind enough to have a list of those uh, zip codes that, that are valid. And um, that's the positive, positive security model. The opposite is the negative security model. Yeah. And that would mean that you would deny things from happening and allow uh, everything else by default and that becomes well probably you also understand that it that becomes really really difficult to handle because typically the subset or the uh, amount of things that can take place is smaller than those things or activities that shouldn't take place so we can say that okay these types of things should happen in our program or in our software but then everything else, because then that's up to basically to the creativity of, of anyone using using your, your software. So it's easier to basically say that, okay, these things are okay. And these things, uh, everything else should not happen. Compartmentalization. So um, previously, for example, submarines, they were these like long tubes. And if they would get torpedoed, it would ruin the pay for everybody, right? And then they came up with this idea that they're going to compartmentalize it. So yes, it will still ruin the people who are within that compartment, but everybody else will be pretty okay. Well, I don't know how well care you're gonna be after a torpedo hit, but you get the idea. And here, like they, they basically what they did was that they just added gates between different compartments. And every time when, when you were to move to the next compartment, you would just close the door. So a single hole in the body of a submarine, it wouldn't sink the whole boat or, or the, the, well, basically you're supposed to sink the submarine, but you, you get, get the idea. Um, maybe submerge would be a better word here. And this is, extremely efficient way. It's also used very, very widely um, in everything. Like you're doing this unconsciously. So for example, if you're going to a hotel room, you're very often gonna put your valuables to the safe. You're compartmentalizing your stuff. You, you, you have your rest of your luggage laying, laying down there, and then you're putting, putting your valuables to the safe. By the way, that's a bad idea, but that's how people usually think. Because now as an attacker, I'm just going to walk in. I'm going to go straight to the safe. I'm going to hit it once and steal all your, all your valuables. And it will take me like two seconds uh, because I know already where they are. But that's basically an example of like how people compartmentalize different kinds of things. Yeah. And I'm going back to the password example. But one concrete example is that... Um... We're again using different passwords for, for different services. We're maybe using even different emails. So let's say that one of our emails get compromised and that email can be used to recover accounts that we're using in different services, for example, uh, Netflix, our uh, social media and things like this. So if we think about uh, the worst case scenario, what could happen if someone get access to this specific account, to this specific email uh, account, for example, uh, we can start to think about how to mitigate the uh, impacts even of, of this attack then so that the attacker is not then able to gain access to all of our uh, streaming services and social media accounts and then sell those again to someone. But instead, we block them uh, at places where, where we can. 
sensitive data. First. Yeah, uh, and this is also a little bit of a th <laughs> philosophical question. Of course, there's sensitive data such as um, social security numbers, home addresses, phone numbers even, uh, that then we entrust to, for, for example, to service providers, and we're already sharing that information to someone. But sensitive data is more than that. It's also things we share with people, and secret can also be known by three people if two of them are dead. Isn't that correct? Yeah. <laughs> so if we really, really want to also think about the, mm, the ways that we handle data, of course, we, we give out the sensitive information to, to service providers all the time. But uh, whenever sharing information about ourselves or of our friends, it's also something that we can then decide, is this something that I want to uh, share forever online? Because basically whatever is, is out there will be there forever because it can be copied by someone, someone can make a meme out of it. Uh, it can be stored by someone for, for personal purposes. So it's really about also uh, understanding that some things may not be okay to share. On a corporate setting, it usually means that if you don't need the data, don't even store it in the first place because then it cannot be stolen. And uh, also, um, by definition, for example, your credit card numbers, there are a number of companies out there that actually had made a business for themselves for storing credit card numbers. So if you're, for example, if you're, if you're using pretty much any other system than Amazon, because Amazon actually stores your credit card numbers, but uh, all the other players out there, and that's because they want to have their one click user experience that you can just do online shopping easily. So they're taking the risk. Uh, but all the other e-commerce providers, basically, they don't store your credit card number at all. So they outsource that to a specific provider who's then going to make sure that sensitive data, that piece of sensitive data is handled accordingly. And this very often you're actually chaining these different type of things. For example, here, you're also compartmentalizing because you're moving it away. From, from, the, from the place where the rest of the data is stored. But you're also using least privilege uh, thinking here because that backend system might be only able to access that may basically make a decision whether this credit card is valid or not and so on. So this sense, uh, the, the sensitive data thing is a super difficult one, especially nowadays when all the companies are storing a lot of information, but at least you want to try to minimize your footprint on all the systems that you're using to only store the data that is uh, that is absolutely definitely needed. Yeah, and, and one thing for, from like personal point of view is that if you are shopping online and the, the uh, website or the shop you're using does not provide or does not use external payment provider, for example, PayPal or things like these, then that could be a red flag if, if they have implemented everything on their own, uh, because this centralizing of, of sensitive data, it may sound hazardous because then we're like, yeah, one basket. And um, if that, that place gets breached, then all of that data get, gets breached, which is of course true. But in centralizing sensitive data, we can actually put more effort and, and money in protecting that one thing. Because if you're doing everything, it can be really hard to also protect everything because you need the people, you need the money, you need the resources to actually protect that. That's why it's really important for, for using these external providers. Next up, transparency. It's basically, there is this old saying, you can read it from there, but transparency means it's basically a principle that a security control should always be transparent. You can tell it to anybody and it won't compromise the actual security control. But uh, for example, you're using cryptography on a daily basis. Like even if you're surfing the net or doing whatever, you're unconsciously using a lot of cryptography stuff. Now, the way of the cryptography works is actually public information. But the keys that are using, used to secure your communications, those are not. So that's the difference. Like any sort of thing, it should not be based on security through obscurity principle. 
so that people are trusting that something is just so complex that never <laughs> nobody's ever going to figure it out. I have a news flash for you. They will. Yeah, and maybe a side topic, but I think an uh, interesting note about open source, for example, is that, um, for example, there was the uh, vulnerability uh, last late last year uh, that affected basically everything that we use, uh, and and well. Besides the technicalities, I think a lot of the discussion was aimed also at is open source secure because we are making it available for everyone to read and access and, and then go through and find vulnerabilities. But uh, the opposite of that would then be closed source, which means that the code is not available for everyone. And yeah, there's of course things that need to be keep, kept secret, passwords and uh, the private keys for encryption and things like these. But it's actually sometimes better to make things open source because then you can have more people looking at the, the thing itself. Uh, and, and you can build communities around developing specific tools or, or specific things that then also help to mitigate bugs or security issues because people happen to look at them uh, more widely. The reason we have this photo here, this picture here, is that traditionally, especially in the US, the voting machines have been black boxes. So they are not really transparent. And now when people actually started looking at those, they were absolutely horribly insecure. So usually only transparent security systems are functional. They, they, they actually provide the services or the properties that you want to have. Validated trust. This has to do, like, this is the primary reason, for, for example, why phishing attacks or those kind of things, they actually work. So um, we're, our mind is making assumptions of things. Airline security is one of my favorite topics. Um, and when 9-11 when took place, basically what happened was that all the U.S. airports, they hired thousands of people, like basically beat cops to, to walk down the corridors. And now you ask, like, okay, how did the fact that you recruit thousands of cops to the airports, how would they help stopping the 9-11 from happening again? And the answer is that it, it has absolutely zero impact. So if you want to do airline security properly, you just need to go to Israel and ask El Al. They've been operating under very hostile conditions since 69 and not have had a single successful incident. But they are doing things differently. Like, for example, all, all the airplanes that El Al has, they're actually the pilots go to the cockpit from the outside. So good luck uh, trying to get in as a passenger. And also, when they take your luggage, they actually pressurize it to uh, 10,000 feet or 10,000 kilometers to see that if there are any bombs out there that are pressure activated, they would go off on, on the chamber that they're testing those through. They're also asking you nice questions when you go to Israel, like uh, basically interrogating you. Uh, they just do it in a very, very nice manner. And if you're traveling with your friends, they are comparing notes like, okay, Laura, where did you go? And then they're going to ask me the same questions. And word of advice, if you're ever traveling with Mikko Hyppinen, he's terrible at this. He doesn't remember where he's been. So um, be conscious of your friends who you're traveling with. But anyways, this is the, like, the trust decisions should, we always, should always be based on, on validated things like real data points and not just feeling. That's also where the phishing scams work because you think that, oh, Nike was sending me a message. Adidas, oh, so nice of them. Like, and that's, that's why you basically your mind stops working and you do something idiotic. Yeah, and online, it can be really difficult to validate someone. Of course, you can uh, see from the email if it actually came nike.com or from nike.com or from something else. But... Uh, especially if we think about scams that people fall for, whether it's investment, whether it's love, whether it's things like this, uh, it's really 
difficult to validate if the people you're talking to is actually who they claim to be. It's easy to validate the connections that they are secure and things like these. But when you have someone who is dedicated, they may have built up whole internet presses just um, pretending to be someone else. They may have their own company website. They may have social media accounts. They may appear to be real, but actually they are not. And sometimes they could actually be real, but they are faking stuff online. For example, I don't know if you've seen, I think it was a really good documentary on, on Netflix called um, it was Tinder Swindler, where this person was not actually, well, they were real. They had their real photos online, but everything else was fake. They had built up these profiles. They had um, faked news, uh, like news outlet uh, news that they were son of this one really uh, wealthy family. And through using internet and kind of like this trust that they created, with people just by like they Googled him and they found all this information. They had this uh, basically on like trust that they have put on this person that was not uh, something that they should have given to him. And then they fell, fell victim to this very elaborate up scam. Now this, this guy was a, like they were hustling and doing a lot of uh, like they were professional in doing this, but this can happen also on smaller scale and it does happen. Uh, and in Finland, for example, People are losing, uh, uh, I think last year it was 40 million, almost a uh, billion, sorry, 40 billion to different types of scams online, whether it was investment, love scams, call center scams and things like these. So so it, it is really, really difficult to validate trust online. And one thing could be that, uh, well, asking for a FaceTime with this person. You can catch scams by by just asking for, for a video call or things like this, at least Nowadays, maybe once uh, AI generated content becomes more available, it can be even trickier. But then there are cases, for example, as this Tinder swindler guy, um, where it can be really, really difficult to find the truth of the matter, matter because they are leveraging and they're kind of like uh, using this hacker mindset to uh, create a personality online that does not exist in real life. So next time that Nigerian prince contacts you, just ignore it. Yeah, and, and to be honest, I think Nigerian prince and these kind of scams and, for example, these things that come to our email, we're really already tuned to understand that, okay, this is trash. For example, email is just full of trash. It's advertisements. It's these, uh, yeah, please invest. I'm, I'm a wealthy person and you are my lost relative. Please send your bank information. And I think we are all kind of already understanding, most of us are understanding that this is, okay, this is not uh, something that should be done. But that's why these scam centers, they are, uh, they have multiple people there working uh, messaging people, finding people on social media, finding ways of establishing this unvalidated trust with people in order to steal them, uh, steal money from them. Next up, simplicity. So complexity is the worst enemy of anything that needs to be secure. Um, there is an example here. Like um, uh, this is a real world photo of a of an elevator where somebody was brilliant enough to come up with this thing that first you need to scan the QR code, then you download the app to open the app, they scan the QR code again with the app, and then you call the elevator or you push the button. Like whichever sounds better to you. I, this is like nowadays we have this trend that everything needs to be smart. And you, you cannot get a toaster anymore without it talking to you like, hello, oh, would you like to toast me today? You know, it, it, it's idiotic. And, and every time if you're doing something complex or if the security of anything that you do is extremely complicated, there's a good probability that it's going to be wrong. I, I, one of my favorite saying is that for every complex problem, there is a solution that is simple, elegant, and wrong. Yeah, and, and if we think about like I think good example <clears throat> from a developer point of view or if you are like working in IT is that your company has really strict policies and not really usable guidelines in using, for example, uh, how to actually securely connect to your uh, servers, your production site uh, securely. And then you make shortcuts to make it easier. So they, they may have actually given you, okay. Oh, sorry, that's fine. So sorry. Remember to deliver a talk. Yeah. Reminder. Jesus Christ, I'm so sorry. 
yeah, they they use shortcuts to to access the servers, and yeah, that was just my alarm in case anyone uh, online didn't hear that. And why am I running away? Uh, so, so they are basically using shortcuts to get things done because the company may have provided them with elaborate ways of, of how to access this specific site or server. But then they're like, yeah, why don't I just make this available to the internet and make it easier to access? So it's also about, again, going back to user experience and, and avoiding over-engineering in everything because that just breeds creativity in people and in users and making things simple and easy to use and easy to use in a secure manner. Conclusions. So if we go back to this diagram, we are basically walking you through of these different principles or, or items on this is like, you have the offensive side, you have the defensive side, and there are different principles or patterns that you can use. You, you can apply them actually quite widely. But the most important thing is to use common sense. That's, it, it's very often that you actually kind of overthink ideas or you overthink things. Uh, but if you're just using common sense, it will take you far. Yeah, and I think it's just, I think that one of the key takeaways is that attackers and the criminals, they're just people like us. They have just found ways of, of how to make money out of exploiting these patterns and exploiting uh, different things that uh, not just technology, but people, processes, and how they're leveraging all of this to get to to us, whether it's company, like company sensitive data that they are storing, whether it's our photos, whether it's our money, it's always done by someone, like someone else, a human, and they have always the chances of getting caught, of, of uh, not wanting to get caught actually, and, and the ways or, or the means that they have at which they can use to exploit us. Thank you. I guess we're pretty close to being done. Um, yeah, the Isabella, alarm rang have... already. So. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah. All right. So there was one question from online, which is from Rita. Why not use our laptops with administrator accounts? If we work with the laptop and need to install or modify applications or access all files, it would seem illogical to use a plain account. Okay, so the question was, why shouldn't I be using my laptop as an administrator? First of all, all modern operating systems, even if you're using them as a regular user, if the admin privileges are needed, the, the computer is going to prompt you. It's going to tell you that hey, it looks like you're trying to install a piece of software. Please put your admin credentials here. Then you just only do that, and then you go on with your life. Also, like, uh, I don't really understand the point of like, how would you wouldn't be able to access all your files because as a regular user, all the stuff that you have is accessible to you. It's not limited in any way. And the reason why you don't want to run the com your computer as an administrator is that if there is a single vulnerability, for example, web browser, they're extremely complex things. Like we don't really think about that, but they are very, very complex things. And if you think of the use case, what you use the web browser for, you're surfing the net with it. And effectively, you can you, you need to parse all these different image formats, video formats, texts, like things X, Y, Z. And even a single vulnerability in the web browser can compromise your whole computer if you're running it as an administrator. Now, if you're not running it, you're running your computer as an administrator, it might be that the person attacking you or your web browser, might, they might still be able to compromise the web browser, but they're not gonna take over your, your whole operating system. And the, once again, the attack will be way more limited. Awesome, no more questions online, but does anyone here have any questions? I will bring you the mic. Everybody speaks English. <laughs> Just checking. Yes, also <laughs> questions in Finnish. Are yeah, okay. Any any type of question is fine. It doesn't have to be tech related, in my opinion. 
Ya. All right, let's see if I'm like too loud or something. Cool. Uh, firstly, big thank you. Super interesting. Um, but I wanted to ask, uh, kind of wrapping together two topics that you went through. So from user perspective, obviously, the more security there is, the more annoying it is to use anything because you're like, mm. ah, yet again, this authentication, ah, where's the phone? <laughs> um, but on the other hand, we want to build these things so that we are actually safe. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. Um, so getting back to the balance you mentioned. So let's build something that is safe enough that it's good to use, but also not meteor proof. How, from a user perspective, would you actually have any idea where that line goes? Like, like if I'm in that elevator, they're going like, ah, oh, but it's COVID times and the guy before looked real shady. So I want to kind of don't want to touch this button and yeah, I have like five it. minutes to spare. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I'm there with my foot. <laughs> I don't know, but like, you see my point. Yeah. So how would you know? Where is that line? Oh, the, I guess the answer is twofold. Uh, first of all, as in like, if you're, working for an entity, like let's say a company, then I feel that the, the whole purpose of the security function is to, to be an enabler. Like it needs to enable your, whatever you're doing. Uh, basically it means that the company needs to be able to provide you with tools that are not only nice to use, but they also get the, get the job done. So you, you shouldn't have pixels on your screen that you're not, you're, you're not allowed to click. If, if you don't get that, basically, most probably very often means that the IT or security uh, on your company is not very good. Uh, so the usability should always be there because like Laura mentioned, if the user experience is crappy, people will get creative. Like they're going to find ways. It's like water. It will go to places that you don't really want to. And, and then the other thing is like basically as a user, like on your personal life, um, it, it really depends on the use case. I personally, this is, uh, there's a thing called security hygiene. So, you know, you, you brush your teeth every day and you hopefully take a shower every once in a while. Uh, so it's the same thing. Like what are the security related things that you use on a daily basis? Like maybe it would make sense to uh, take good care of your keys so that nobody else is gonna be able to use them maybe use different passwords for different things online so that you're not going to be compromised like very very simple things that will have a huge impact so you basically use the things that you do and then you stick with that um i don't know if that answers your question well but maybe yeah I can yeah I, yeah i can expand on that probably a little bit so that is a really tricky question to answer because there are stuff that we can we can do, of course, as T said, the passwords and things like this. Try to kind of like think about the security in that manner. But if we are in such a position that we can affect security posture any way of tools that we are using, because day-to-day -day lives we're using, for example, in our work, we may be using tools and software that is not really good to use. And and you can already tell that perhaps the users of these applications were not consulted before taking this application to use. So if you are in such position that you can affect this, it may not be even IT or security problem. It may be company problem. The company is not actually uh, asking users uh, the questions that, that should be asked. They are not investing in modern technology. They are not investing in tools that are great, uh, easy to use. So naturally we can all voice our concerns and try to contact our like uh, in the company or in the context that, that we encounter these things, we can try to leverage, not leverage, but escalate these, these issues to someone and make our voices heard. But in some cases, it can be just politics and it can be poor decision making that is driving the, these uh, hard to use, literally like bad applications that we have to use every day. I have a feeling that we didn't really answer the question, but. <laughs> Sorry, that's... We, I don't think there is a perfect answer. Yeah, politics, show business for ugly people. <laughs> we have actually, the chat is popping. We have quite a few questions online. So let's take a few from here. So how risky are USB drivers? How risky are we? How risky are USB drivers? 
USB drives. Uh, USB. Uh, USB drivers. Yeah. Yes. Perhaps USB sticks or or something I, like I that. Drives so, or yeah. Like the if you if you have it in your possession, basically zero risk. But what you need to understand, like if you're dealing with USB drives, I, I guess it's drives, not drivers. Drivers is the thing that is part of your operating system, basically. The USB drive, so like an external mass storage thing. Um, the important thing to understand that if you lose it, anybody will be able to access it. So my basically advice would be that if you really need to use external storage, use hardware encrypted storage. So you can go to any online store and buy hardware encrypted storage. In that case, if somebody's able to steal it or you lose it, all your photos there or whatever, then nobody's going to be able to access it without knowing the pin code. Yeah, and perhaps in the past, and I think this has been in the news quite, or like, let's say a couple of years past, but like hacking computers through USB devices. And actually, if you watch Team WAC, it's a, a documentary, TV documentary series we did for Ule. I was part of the, the crew there. We actually used USB sticks to, to insert malware into specific computers. Um, that can, of course, happen, especially if the computers are unlocked, but that requires the attacker to be able to get physical access to the device. And that's all already kind of um, like making the attack more complex because the criminal, they would have to take the plane and, and come to Finland and come to your house or come to your office and, and then sneak in. I'm not saying that couldn't happen, but it increases the attack complexity. So, so I think that's probably one of the misconceptions that that uh, people have that it's it's really viable to use USB sticks for hacking. Also, sorry, I'm, I'm dragging out, but but there's um, one USB stick related thing that also has gained a lot of attention in the past decade, but the hack of, of uh, Iranian nuclear, uh, these fission, uh, these reactors, that happened via a USB stick that was compromised. And that happened via a state sponsored or state backed actor. They were able to basically insert, insert malware through the supply, like during the supply chain life cycle of this USB device. And then once that USB device was uh, inserted in a computer that was completely blocked from outside internet, they were able to insert malware through that USB stick because it was implemented with that malware when it was basically built. So, so I think there's a lot of kind of like scary things related to USB stick that has been on the news, but I think it's as T mentioned, the biggest concerns that we should have when we're using USB sticks is that we lose it and lose all the information that we're storing on it. That being said, USB is just a physical interface. So even if it, it might look like a USB stick, it can, do, it can be whatever. Like, for example, when we were doing red teaming, uh, we would use those kind of, there, there are multiple names for those, but one of the names, uh, if you go online and you, you search for right, rubber duck, um, it's basically a small computer that can emulate keyboard devices. So it looks like a USB mass storage thing, but when you plug it in, it will just start typing 10,000 characters a minute or, or something ridiculous and not going to do any mistakes, typing mistakes. And that can be very, very powerful because then you can, if you, if you see a workstation that is unlocked, you can have your payload there. You can insert the device there and then take it over in like 30 seconds or so. Yeah, and I think those kind of threats, this is goes actually back to threat modeling again, but these could be relevant in places where computers are static at a, uh, like a specific place, for example, in hospitals or places like this, and also where public access is, is easy and where sensitive data could be stored. So let's say that you are visiting your doctor and they leave the room for a little bit. They leave their computer there uh, unlocked. You could just plug your stuff in and, and insert your malware or just steal data from there. So it, it really comes down to the threat model and where you work, what kind of devices you're using. But uh, in that sense, everything can be used again to perform attacks. But then it comes down to the threat model. Is this relevant for me? Thank you. Um... Does anyone have here in person any burning questions other, other than that? Or should I take another online? No? Okay. 
So, um, hi, I want to become a white hat hacker. What kind of studies should I pursue? Uh, I don't have an IT background. I guess you have to have strong coding skills. Could you provide any recommendations for InfoSec certifications? Um, like, uh, for example, personally, I have studied IT in, in Turku University of Applied Sciences, but uh, I got interested in computers and things like this very early on. But I understand this may not be case for everyone and not everyone may have had the privilege of, of getting access to computers early on in their life. But fortunately, there are a lot of good material online that you can uh, use for free to learn this stuff. And now, depending on your starting level, uh, that that only I think that only indicates how much time you may have to spend because uh, infosec and especially hacking, it's a, a unique thing in a sense that you need to know some stuff before you start to do it. So you need to know uh, a little bit about uh, programming. You need to know a little bit about uh, servers, networking things like these before you can uh, understand how to exploit things. But uh, I think one of the good resources that I point people to is Hacker 101. They have this really detailed like syllabus where you can pick what you know already and skip. And then they you can also go through the courses there. So they have, for example, for programming for, webs for websites and some back end, if I remember correctly, then for networking. So understanding, for, for example, what is an uh, IP address, what is a port and things like these, what is a public and what's a private network. Uh, so I think that's a good resource. So Hacker 101, they, if you look for it, Hacker 101, I think it's Hacker for start like introductory course to hackers or something like that. You should be able to find it online. And then there's others, for example, I start by doing CTFs. So that's capture the flag. Those are kind of like gamified challenges for hacking. And even though they, those not, may not always be super realistic in terms of, of real world, uh, like what we are hacking in real world, but they, they give you a good idea of, of how to use specific tools, how to kind of like how these things are operating, what kind of, why is it, for example, bad if something is running with root privileges, how to get reversals and things like these. So, so that's at least what I recommend doing. And then uh, these days uh, there are specific courses, if not whole like fields of study that are revolving around cybersecurity. Uh, those are in different places around Finland. So, so uh, like definitely if, if studying at school is something you are looking forward to, I think that's something that you can also then check out. Most probably I'm going to be horrible uh, giving advice on this, but because I'm I'm so old, but um, uh, we actually did an episode. I mean, if, if the person who's asking the question if he's fluent in barbarian, meaning in Finnish, uh, we actually did an episode with Herrasmias Hakkarit about exactly this. So how do you can get into this? Um, that being said, the, this field is super wide. Like you, you can specialize on on like number of things. Um, and personally, I think it's about preference. Like if if the, the if the prison wants to play hacker, then what Laura said might make sense. But if the prison wants to get into security, I think that uh, investing in the cloud security would be a very, very smart move at the moment. So doing like DevSecOps, so secure development, uh, learning about AWS, learning about Google Cloud, uh, learning the most relevant technologies like containers, Kubernetes, Docker, Terraform, um, like the, the whole Kool-Aid park. Uh, I think that would make a lot of sense. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. And I feel like there's a question that kind of would summarize uh, things quite nicely. Um, so is there a way to sort of clean up your profile um, online if you've forgotten where you have profiles and where you have registered and so on. Um, how can you kind of stay safe online? Well, uh, I think that requires you to kind of at least remember where you've logged in. And uh, as European citizens, we are covered by GDPR, so General Data Protection Regulation, which states that if we want our information to be deleted from a specific site or 
um, social media or whatever, we can request that. So deletion of data is always possible and it's our right that we can request from the providers that we are using. Um, you can do some of that cleaning up yourself so you can remove old tweets and old posts that are not probably suitable this, this, <laughs> this time or, or today. But then if you want yourself to be more forgotten, for example, you can ask Google to remove your search results and things like this. So there's actually a lot of power that we can employ. And if someone is not willing to um, cooperate, you can always say that, hey, I will uh, contact the uh, data privacy officer in, here in Finland or Tietosuja Valtuutettu in Finnish. And, and then they should at least co cooperate after that. <laughs> 